I've often heard somebody say, the Lord is good. And inevitably, somebody will say, he's good all the time. And that's a declaration of God's character, right? He is good all the time. And um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's an, an expression of God's character. That's what he's like. In all of our Bible studies, we must be careful that the character of God is not misrepresented because God is good. The Bible says so. In fact, 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. That's the benchmark of what his character is like. I think uh, last week you heard a little bit about agape love, a love that doesn't, not, doesn't seek anything in return. It's an unselfish love. That's the kind of love that God has. <clears throat> Our message to the world you know, is all about the character of God. <clears throat> That's the best kept secret in all the world. It, indeed, it's the last message of mercy to the world, what God is really like. So we have in the message of three angels, the representation that God's character is love. Three angels, the final message to the world before Jesus comes. The everlasting gospel is great news. Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea. That's our, that's our eternal home. Heaven, earth, sea. God created these things for us as a great act of love for us. And we worship him for that. Then we read in the third angel's message, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever in the third angel. So how are we supposed to teach all these things? God is love, right? Infinitely loving God. And then it says, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Third angel. Well, let's read the third angel's message. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 11. This is going to be sort of a practical sermon today because in just about every Bible study that I do, this is something that's not very well understood. I was a dentist for most of my life, and one day, a lady and I got into a discussion about this subject. And I asked her, I said, how come you believe that? Why would you believe such a thing? Because they deserve it. Do you think that's God's attitude toward the wicked? We're going to discuss that subject this morning. The third angel, Revelation 14, 9 to 11. Let's read it. It says, and the third angel followed them. Remember, this is our message for the world. Actually, the third angel is the most stern warning given in the Bible, anywhere in the scripture. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. What kind of a loud voice? A loud voice. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark. And... Uh, how we're supposed to teach this on the surface, it appears to be contradictory to God's character of love on the surface. That's God's final message to the world. The character of God issue is involved here. These are the words of the third angel. How do we understand such words about smoke of their torment forever and ever? No rest day or night. All this in the context of God's character of love. And some have taken this to mean never ending fire, never ending punishment and brimstone for millions of years, time without end. 
there is a painting done in the Middle Ages of hell. The huge fires and the people in, the, in there being tormented terribly and vociferously. And here's the devil with a pitchfork. Here's this poor guy trying to climb out of the, out of the pit and he takes that pitchfork and pushes him back in again. That's how they taught. That's a middle age idea. Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan pastor, says sinners will burn at the hands of an angry God and, and he taught that never ending meant always without end. Is that what the Bible teaches? How do we reconcile this with other passages that teach that the wicked will suffer the second death? What does death mean? Suffer the second death. What does that mean? You know, one of the most popular texts in all the Bible is John 3.16, and it's also one of the most, most misunderstood ones. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not what? Perish. Perish. That's a very strong word. Perish. What does it mean? They're gone. Gone forever. So, uh, the wicked will suffer the second death and will uh, be no more. Perish. That's what the word means. We must never in our thought or in our teachings make the Bible disagree with itself. Many have turned away from God, who is pictured this way, that God punishes unendingly for sin of a, just a mere 70 years, plus or minus a few. Disobedience, suffer millions and millions of years. They say, how can you love a cruel God like that? And uh, many don't as a result. Let's turn to a passage of scripture. This is going to be, a, this is a very useful text in trying to help people. And that's what we're, we're all about, right? Trying to help people have a good picture of God. What is God really like? Nobody wants to, wants to serve a God who is not a God of love, right? Let's look at it. Psalms 37, 10 and 20. Psalm 37, 10 and 20. That's easy to find. Psalm 37, 10 and 20. And ask yourself, what are these words saying? And there's a whole host of them in the Bible, actually, that we could turn to this morning. Psalm 37, verse 10. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. You shall dil diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Verse 20. But the wicked shall perish. There's that word again. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume, I'm sorry, into smoke shall they consume away. Not be, consume away, perish. Uh, those are very strong, strong words for starters. First of all, we must distinguish between eternal punishment, eternal punishment on one side, and eternal punishing. On the other. Do you see the difference? Eternal punishment means, means gone forever. That's what this text says. And eternal punishing might mean that people will be suffering for millions and millions of years. Eternal punishment, eternal punishing. Eternal, eternal punishment is a confined, limited event of which the effects are eternal. The effects are eternal. While the eternal punishing embraces the idea of never-ending process, there's a great, great difference here between the two. A process indeed, never-ending, burning in torment, without end. Now, we use the same word forever sometimes with the, with the righteous. They're going to live how long? Forever. So this word can be used in a number of different ways. In the case of the righteous, it means unending, right? Forever, <laughs> okay? In the case of the wicked, it uh, has a different meaning. I'd like to have you turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 
some of you are writing the text down. I'm glad for that. This, these are texts that you can go to and that you can help people have a better understanding of the salvation plan that God has for people, earth people. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. It says, Study to show thyself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we're going to try to do this morning as we study the Bible together. This is a Bible study today. Rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Peter 3, verse 16. 2 Peter, to the right, a little ways. 2 Peter, chapter 3. Verse 16. I'm sorry, it's 1 Peter 3. <laughs> I'm sorry, again. It's 2 Peter 1. <laughs> 2 Peter 1. I'm just coming to me now. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. That's the first sentence of that. Now I'd like to have you drop down to verse 20. 2 Peter 1 verse 20. Knowing that this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private what? Interpretation. We need to be careful about that. We need to be careful about not making the Bible text disagree with themselves. I once was giving a Bible study. And about the first 15 minutes, one of those people that came to the Bible study had an argument where the where, the, where one text in the Bible was fighting with another one. And it took about 15 or 20 minutes at the beginning of each study, and there were a number of people in the room. This was in Palmdale, California. How many have been to Palmdale, California? Yeah. And uh, so, uh, private interpretation. People have an idea about this, another person has an idea about that, and we call that private interpretation. Warned not to, treat, not to twist the scriptures but rather to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Compare, that's a key word. You'll find that idea in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13. Compare spiritual with spiritual. And uh, there's another text in the Old Testament in Isaiah, Isaiah that says, line upon line, precept upon precept, comparing scripture with scripture. Let the scripture interpret the scripture. In the Old Testament, Job was being accused of being a big sinner. He had some uh, accusers there, and uh, they even accused him of trying to cover it all up. And uh, his accusers declared that this was the reason for the sores. Job was being miserably punished by God because, and, uh, and the, Lord repuved, re, the, the Lord reproved the accusers. Job chapter 42, verse 7. Let's look at that. Job chapter 24, verse 7. 40, I'm sorry, 42, verse 7. Job 42, verse 7. Job 42, verse 7. Just before Psalms. And here's what it says. And it, and it was so, that after the Lord has spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me, the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. What's that text say? They were misrepresenting the character of God, right? Job was suffering terribly, on and on and on. Lost his family. Boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. Sitting in a pile of ashes. And his... Friends were saying, God's doing this to you because you're hiding something from us. Wow. You know, that can happen in a church too, can't it? Could happen. I'm be careful about that. I'm going to be careful about misrepresenting God's character. So, to charge God falsely with the crime of torturing sinners... In a never-ending hell is a serious matter, as we just read from, the, from Job here. The Lord really dealt with these three friends of Job's. 
Indeed, this never-ending torment is far worse than the accusations that God made of Job's false accusers. I believe that when read responsibly, the Bible presents a harmonious, consistent, holistic message. So this morning, I want to say to you, come, let us read it. For starters, the word forever comes from, a, comes from an Old Testament word, olam, O-L-A-M, olam. It means as long as it lasts. That's what the word means. If you go to Strong's Concordance, that's what the word means, as long as it lasts. Notice how it's used in 1 Samuel 1, I'm just to conserve time. I'll just give you the text and I'll tell you what it says. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22, Hannah is giving her, is, is promising to give her son to the Lord along. Forever, it says in that text. And then two de three texts down in verse 28, actually six texts down, in verse 28 she says, I'm giving him to the Lord as long as he lives. How long is forever? In that situation, it's as long as he lives. His lifetime. Uh, Jonah said he was in the belly of the, of the great fish forever. You find that in, in um, Jonah 2 verse 6. But Jesus said that he was in the belly of the whale how long? Three days and three nights. So how long is forever in Jonah's situation? Three days and three nights. As long as it lasts. Olam. It's a Hebrew word. So, the fish vomits him out, and then it's all over with. And when we use these words in our modern English, like forever, it seems to mean never ending. That's what it seems. When, when we just read the word, that's the word, that's, the, that's what I get. So, we must be careful of the language barriers and current words and meanings and the context. Now, in the New Testament, there's a word for forever, and that's the word aeon or ion. Pastor Jim here can probably tell me how to pronounce that. Ion. Trans it's A-I-O-N. That's how it's spelled. Forever. And the word means age, or we get the word eon from that. An eon. Forever. An eon. So what is an age or an eon? We believe we're living in the computer age. Oh, are we ever? <laughs> I'm overwhelmed with this. There's some here who are very good at computers, but we're living in the computer age. A few years ago, we said we're living in the, what kind of an age? Atomic age, the atomic age. And um, it does not necessarily mean, when we're talking this, it does not necessarily mean to define a definite period. But our language looks, looks at it forever as never ending. It will be a forever destruction, not a forever destroying. We need to be careful about that word. The Bible speaks of unquenchable fire, Matthew 3, verse 12. Jesus talks about that, unquenchable fire. What is an unquenchable fire? It don't go out, right? Until what? The fuel's burned up. Okay. So uh, there's a warning given to Jeremiah the prophet. Let's look at it. It's Jeremiah 17, verse 27, about Jerusalem. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27. Old Testament book, two books before, before Daniel. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27. Jeremiah 17, verse 27, and it says... And if you will not hearken to me to hell of the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden even entering at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Who can understand that? The city faced unquenchable fire if they continued in rebellion. Sin is rebellion. Willful sin is rebellion, right? God is not going to take a bunch of rebels to heaven. And he's talking to them about this. They were passing stuff in and out of the gates of Jerusalem. The Gentiles are bringing food and stuff in. Stuff that could be sold to the Jews. And they were going in and out of the gates of Jerusalem on Sabbath day. 
taking care of their business. In the days of Nehemiah, he said, I had, to, I had to lock the gates of Jerusalem to keep people from doing that. By the way, how serious is rebellion? In uh, 1 Samuel, it says, it says the sin of witchcraft is demonic. Rebellion is, de that's what willful sin is. Willful sin. We just set up. That's silencing the, silencing the voice of the Holy Spirit to us, right? Doing, knowing it's wrong and just doing it anyway. And uh, that's how we blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Witchcraft, rebellion, demonic. The devil has invaded our space and our earthly home. And rebellion in the, is the hallmark of Satan's character. That's what Satan's character is like. He lies about God. He lies about the character of God. This is the issue, the big issue in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. What is God really like? So, the city faced unquenchable fire. Did it happen? Yes, it did. And concerning the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., let's turn to 2 Kings, to the left a little way. 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 9. 2 Kings 25, verse 9. Second Kings 25, verse 9. It says, And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great man's house burned he with fire. And then notice how the author of Chronicles connects the dots and makes it clear that the destruction fulfilled remarkably the prophecy made by Jeremiah. That's 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36, 19 and 20. <clears throat> and they burned the house of God. This is after the fact. And broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that escaped from the sword were carried away to Babylon. And they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Until the time of Darius and Cyrus. Jerusalem was out of business. So when we read the Bible, we need to bear in mind Olam and Ion. And the differences between that and our modern word forever. Good scholarship demands that we do that. Now... A couple of texts in the New Testament. Jude verse 7. Jude verse 7. And we're going to read that verse in 2 Peter 2.6 also. Jude is that little one chapter book just before Revelation. Jude verse 7. Here's what it says. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the, ven suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. Eternal fire. Eternal fire. Now let's compare that with 2 Peter 2, verse 6. Back to the left, just a couple of pages. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example to those that after should live ungodly. Do we want to know what eternal fire is? Study the history of these two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. They're set forth for an example of those who would after live ungodly. Eternal fire. Now let's not be misled here. Did indeed Sodom and Gomorrah suffer the fires of divine judgment? They did. God is a God of mercy and justice. Jonah preached a message of judgment, and they all repented. And God, in his mercy, delivered them. They, that, that city of Nineveh probably would have burned to fire, too. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No. However, even though the flames are not arising today, from those reprobate cities, the effects of that destruction were forever, eternal. Uh, some have said we don't even know where they are. 
Others have said, yes, there's evidence that there was something, something fire, burned with fire and brimstone near the Red Sea, or Dead Sea, near the Dead Sea. But they'll never be rebuilt. This is what the Bible is telling us will happen when the wicked who rebel against God are destroyed. I heard an interesting idea from uh, in camp meeting, a camp meeting this year. I mentioned it in prayer meeting just briefly. I can't conceive of God causing people to suffer the burning of fire for any period of much, any period of time. Do you know what it feels like to, just to burn your finger on a hot stove? Yeah. Now it's true that uh, sin is going to be destroyed and sinners will be destroyed. But they're not going to last very long. How, how long does it take to lose consciousness? And then the remains burn until, the, until it's all gone. You know, I, I, we have to look at God with what else is said in the Bible about him, right? All these texts. So Jerusalem fell unquenchable flames. The prophecy was fulfilled, but the, but the flames eventually did go out when the fuel was gone. Unquenchable simply means it would not be stopped until what was burning had perished. And when it is finished, its, jo its, its job, it will cease. There was a fire burning in Northern California. Some of you, or North Central California, some of you suffered that. One person here that's here this morning told me that he drove through that with his car. Wow. In Southern California a few years ago, the flames leaped across 12 lanes of traffic on Interstate 15 on its destructive journey. But these unquenchable fires eventually did go out, thankfully, right? Aren't you glad? And so too with the unquenchable fires that devour the wicked. So let's return to the third angel. Smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Keep in mind that Revelation draws heavily on historical stories from the Old Testament. In, in fact, the book of Revelation is a compilation of over 600 things from the Old Testament. It's just a little tiny book. You can read it in three or four hours. 600 illustrations from the Old Testament there. So Revelation, where it talks about the smoke of their torment ascending up forever and ever, Is, uh, is draws heavily from the Old Testament. So that's John's preferred method of teaching from the Old Testament. That's the only Bible he had to teach from. So we must not ignore history. Good hermen hermeneutics demands it so we don't rely on private interpretation. This particular phrase, smoke of their torment ascend forever and ever, comes from the Old Testament. And it's a prophecy concerning the Edomites, who are descendants of Esau in the Old Testament. Edomites, descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. Edom just rejoiced in the affliction of their brother Judah when Babylon attacked Jerusalem. Can you get the picture? Edom was out there, and as uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his armies were doing, the, doing that during their work, Edom looted Judah's possessions, cut off escape routes, delivered to Nebuchadnezzar any of those who attempted to flee. Here they are out there on the circumference of the city, getting people and giving them to Nebuchadnezzar. And looting. Nice guys, huh? Talks about that in Obadiah. That's a one chapter book. We won't turn to it in the interest of time. Verses 10 to 14. Unhappy with Edom for her treachery, God predicted that Edom would fall. And let's look at it. Isaiah 34, 5 to 10. Isaiah 34, 5 to 10. <clears throat> Isaiah 34, 5 to 10. And my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Judea, upon Judea, Idumea, I'm sorry, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, and it, made, and it is made with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of kidneys of rams and, and um, sorry here. For the Lord has sacrificed, has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumenia. 
and the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and the land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust shall be into brimstone, and the land thereof shall be but become burning pitch. Now the Edomites were those people from Idumea. It shall not be quenched day or night. The smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation shall it lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Wow, that's where John got that expression. Smoke is sin. How long does the smoke ascend? Until nothing, nothing else is left to burn. So, did that happen? Yes, it did. Does the smoke of Edom punishment still ascend? No. Does the fact that Edom's fires would not be quenched day or night mean that those fires would last without end? Keep this in mind as John in Revelation uh, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 11 says, the smoke of their tent ascended up forever and ever. So, when the fires burn, there'll be no rest, no escape for, the, for them. There will be smoke as long as it burns. Smoke is a symbol of torment, the smoke of their torment. Happened to the Edomites because of their treachery to their brother Judah, who was being overthrown by the Babylonians. So the description does not require us to believe that such fire will continue without end. The flames that annihilate the wicked cannot be stopped as long as they burn. The lost have no rest day or night while the destroying fires do their work. The torment, I believe, will be eternal in the sense that the effect is eternal. The Edomites are not still being, being uh, burned. The fire that consumes the wicked will be as the fire that destroyed Edom. And those no longer burn today. Smoke shall ascend forever and ever, the prophecy says. In no way means continuous or never ending. It is the destruction that will be eternal. The separation will be eternal. There will be an utter end. Nahum 1.9 says that affliction will not rise up. What, what does it say? A second time. Now, God in his mercy. Now, this is the important part of our sermon. Too bad it's come so late. God in his mercy has given a way of escape from eternal punishment. Meaning, what kind of punishment? It'll never rise up a second time. It's always going to be gone forever. It's the everlasting gospel. The everlasting covenant, the blood of the covenant atones for every repentant sinner, no matter how bad they've been. It doesn't matter how long a person's been a sinner. When the light comes on, the darkness flees. Is that right? Yes. And the light lightens the mind, the light of the gospel. When people that are reached with the gospel, it doesn't matter how long they've been out there. But when the light comes on, immediately the darkness flees. This comes to us as a gift, but it costs somebody a lot to get it for us. Let's try to count the cost. We'll never be able to add it up like numbers, but let's try to count the cost just a little bit. Notice these scenes in Gethsemane where Jesus has no rest day or night. Drops of blood coming through his skin. The modern world has no appetite to hear about God's justice. But Jesus, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the next day on the cross, was suffering with no rest day or night. Many say, just tell me about grace and mercy and forgiveness. Forget about the justice part and the retribution and all of that. Is God's character, in, in reality, God's character is... One of mercy and justice, right? What, would you, what do you think of an unjust judge? Once in a while you hear of an unjust judge, right? You'll hear it on the news just about every other day. 
Really, you can't have one without the other. It would be foolish to ignore the part of God's character that deals with sin. Notice the second commandment. Let's look at it. Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. I probably should have just told you about this, but let's look at it. And showing mercies to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. I should do verse 5 with it. You shall not bow down yourself to them, nor serve them, for I, I the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. So God is a God of stern justice. And who was it that received the justice? It was Jesus there on the, in Gethsemane and on the cross. Um, Sin is rebellion, and God needs to deal with it. He cannot take rebel, rebels to heaven. Only one being in the universe has experienced the enormity of sin's results, and that's our Savior, Jesus. Sin must be dealt with because it is the great grit in the gears of, our, of all relationships. If you have gears and you have sand in the gears, what happens? You have heat develop and failure. This is what sin is. It has destroyed the relationship, the connection between God and us. It has to be dealt with. It's the cause of all relational suffering. To excuse sin is to immortalize it. We cannot expect God to deal with our sin while we, claim, while we cling to it and not be consumed. But God has a plan. And that plan is in Lamentations chapter 3. You're all familiar with that verse, aren't you? Lamentations. Lamentations of Jeremiah. That comes right after Proverbs. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22. Right after Proverbs. Right after Jeremiah, I'm sorry. Right after Jeremiah. Lamentations of Jeremiah. Some think that Jeremiah wrote the Lamentations because of the death of King Josiah. He's lamenting because he knows that things are not going to go good. Josiah was a good king, right? And the three that followed him carried him off to Babylon. So, verse 22, chapter 3 of Lamentations, verse 22. It says, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Because, of his, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We're here this morning because of the mercy of God. The human family would have long since become extinct were it not for all of that. So, uh, only a God of love. And what would do what he did. The words of the third angel says, talks about the cup the cup of, that the wicked will suffer during, the, during their destruction. But you know, when Jesus was in Gethsemane, you remember what he said? Oh Lord, let this cup pass from me. What was the cup that he was holding? He was suffering the vengeance of God towards sin because he became sin for us. He took the accumulated sins of all, all people for, for 6,000 years and he suffered the guilt of that, and he carried that cup in his hand right to the very bitter end. He suffered the vengeance of eternal death, the second death. And yet he came out of the grave. Divinity cannot die, but he became one of us. And to him it seemed as though there was no place to go, that he would not come up in the resurrection, that he would not be able to ever see his father again. You can read about that in the 88th Psalm, which prophesied that he would be separated from his father. Oh, father, I'll never see you again. It's a tremendous thing. That's what sin is. I believe this is the agony that the wicked will suffer. 
the eternal separation of what they have missed. And truly, they have missed everything. Everything will be missed. Bitter cup. Jesus took that cup. See him there in Gethsemane. No one except Jesus, who has an infinite capacity to suffer. You know, the wicked will probably not be conscious very long after the fires come. They suffer the guilt for their sins. But Jesus, God, has an infinite capacity to suffer. See what he suffered. He just didn't die right away. Drops of blood coming out of his forehead. And uh, he was carried into the torment of the second death, which would mean carrying the guilt of sin, the sins of 60 centuries of earth people. The Bible says that he was made to be sin for us. Only he has enough resources to pay the bill that we have caused. It was our sins that took him there. Somebody had to pay the bill that was owed to a broken law. We can't pay it. We couldn't live a million lifetimes and pay it back and get it right. But it cost everything to our Lord. What a price to pay. It's either him or us. Which will it be for you? Him or us? You know, we have that wonderful privilege of making that kind of a decision. Paul says that in Romans, he can be just, just, and yet the justifier. In other words, God is just. He took the justice, the suffering that sin has cost. And because of that, he can forgive us. That's what justification is. He can be just on the one hand. He's always going to be just, right? He's the just judge. And on the other hand, he can still be just and forgive us. That's what the sacrifice did for us. We call that grace. He can justify me, take me off the hook, and still be a God of stern justice. And when that stern justice is meted out, we see him hanging on the cross. It's pagan to think that God is, is, is pushing all this onto his son. No, he's dying for the sins of the world voluntarily. The father is not punishing Jesus. He's suffering for your sins and my sins there as he hangs on the cross. To me, he's the justifier of fallen humanity. He's the forgiver of, for, of fallen humanity. That's good news. He can justify me. That cup, cup, he took it. And he drank all of it for us. And when we have communion and we take the cup of wine, what are we, what are we, what are we symbolizing here in our, in our actions? The cost that it made took for us to have salvation. The wine in the cup. And he drank all of it for us. And that's why it says in the communion service, the first communion service on that Thursday evening says he drank all of it. No one among us, no one among those who suffer the second death will ever reach the torment that Jesus endured for a whole world of sinners. He had no rest day or night in Gethsemane and the next day until he finally died. That's forever. It comes to a conclusion. Can you relate that to the eternal torment that's spoken about in the third angel's message? Yeah, we can. You don't have to die that death. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And then he asked the question, why will you die, O Israel? Why would we make such a foolish mistake to die along with all of this? So I'm just going to make a little appeal here. May we rest safely in the arms of Jesus. May we rest there every day. Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your very, very first work. Then spend some time in the Bible learning to know Jesus, whom to know is eternal life. What kind of life? Eternal life. Yes, we are saved in the person of another, in the person who paid the dear price. You've all heard of two, steps of foot, two sets of footprints, right? And when we respond to Jesus every day, there's only one set of footprints. For he carries us across the gulf, the great gulf, in both his mercy and justice. His mercy sets me free. His sacrifice allows him to be just. He is a just God. 
So let's sing this morning the good of the good news. Uh, it's hymn number 633, When We All Get to Heaven. This will all be in the past. And nobody who goes to heaven will ever be able to look down into hell and see the wicked down there burning forever. And, uh, and ever and ever and eons and eons of time. Dear Father in heaven, what a treat it is to think about what you've done for us. You have given yourself for us in ways that we'll never fully understand. Fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving as we go into this new and uncertain week. And please with, be with each one here according to our several needs. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.